So this is maybe our 50th or 51st iOS meetup. Thanks for coming. Uh, tonight our guest is, uh, our first guest is John Reichenthal. I met John at a meetup uh, a couple of months ago over at Google. It was kind of a web mapping meetup and he was talking about the digital city and what better city to become digital than Palo Alto. Uh, I didn't really know too much about him. Later I found out that he had come from O'Reilly, so that's a pretty good place to come. He was formerly CTO at O'Reilly and Associates. Then I visited him at Palo Alto City Hall last Friday, and it was the first time I'd gone in the building not to pay some amount of money associated with parking. Um, so it was, it was a really nice visit. I went up to the top floor because I thought that was where he should be sitting, and they sent me down to the second floor, and I went into his corner office and he showed me his windows, which he said he hadn't been able to see. Am I going to take this story away from you? Okay, he hadn't been able to see out the windows when he first came in because it was stacked high with paper. There were file cabinets all over the place. And I thought, how symbolic of IT and administration that we would have piles of paper in between our desks and the view of the people that we're serving. So he's cleared that out and is... Um, doing things that I'm really enthusiastic about as a, as a person who does business in Palo Alto and likes being here. So he's agreed to come and speak, and you want to come on up? Sure. And he told me uh, he could give the talk that he gave before, sure. some of that, which most of us have not heard, and then also talk about some special things that uh, he might like to do. I said, if you had a room full of app developers, what would you like to say to them? Um, and who considers themselves an app developer here? We have a few. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, thank you all for coming. I appreciate this community, and I'll turn this over to John. Thank you. I guess I get my own mic. Yep. So this is great. I hope I make it worth your while, but I know there's other speakers too. So if mine is a letdown, you have others to look forward to. Um, uh, so I've given this a few times, and and uh, and I'm starting to recognize people. You know. Uh, it's a small community, and as I go around speaking about this subject, I'm seeing some of the entrepreneurs and uh, interesting people doing interesting things here in Palo Alto and beyond. Uh, so thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk about this cool stuff. This is really, really interesting, at least from my perspective. Um, it's, I came from over 20 years in the private sector, and people ask me why did I you know, move into the public sector. Uh, I can't say I woke up like you're know, dreaming of that opportunity, like I was really excited, I'm gonna do um, public sector, but the opportunity to be at the very edge of what I would just call a total transformation of local government was too enticing as a, as a computer scientist, and so I had to go after it and enjoy it for a while and see what little difference if I could make, uh, what, what could it mean for the, for the country and, and beyond. Um, and I'm not let down. It, it's, it's Palo Alto is certainly giving it, this, uh, giving me and my team the opportunity to do some interesting things. We're not doing it alone. <clears throat> we can't. We, we can't afford it. We don't have the capacity, and we, we're not smart enough generally to, to to consider all the options and all the technologies and all the ways we can do really fascinating things. So one of the reasons I love to come to meetings like this is because I get to engage you and uh, elicit your help in, in uh, changing the world. Um, so that's what we plan to do every day as we go to work. Um, let me talk about local government in 2012. Um, I see another familiar face wandering. Hi, Ram. Good to see you. Um, so I'm not going to talk about state government or federal or international. It's very complicated. It's messy. Um, I'll talk about something at least I have some exposure to. Um, at the local government level, you can you can change things. You really have. Some say it gets harder when you when you elevate beyond that. But I want to tell you about the playing field. What is the driver for change? And I kind of will just cover a few different areas here. Uh, you know, it, it shouldn't be lost in you that humanity is moving into cities. Around about 2008, 2009, the majority of humans now live in cities. It's about 51, 52 percent of people, and and it continues at a fairly rapid rate. I don't know what. If you're good at math and you can extrapolate at some point where the bulk of humanity is living in some sort of urban setting, um, that's a big deal. You know, it's a really big deal. Um, this is the place that will define who and what we are as a as a people and as as a as a planet. <clears throat> you know, as you have millions and millions of people moving into concrete jungles, 
uh, all this stuff is expensive and it's complicated. And, and it's getting, um, you know, it's not like we found a, an abundance of new revenue opportunities. If you're following the national debate, this is not lost to you. <clears throat> this is a fake diagram that I put together, but it's probably true. Um, <laughs> in every local city, um, state, and, and at certainly at the national level. Uh, this is what we see. Um, we see revenue potentially going up as the economy improves, um, but certainly the expenses are definitely going up. Um, and we've got to figure that out. It's a big problem. How do you bridge that gap? Um, if you don't do anything about it, we effectively go bankrupt. And uh, many cities have gone bankrupt. It's a difficult place. They can't really go out of business, per se. How can a city really go out of business? But it can become very difficult to operate and, and become very dysfunctional after a bit of time. You know, you're, I think most of you are in technology, so you can probably appreciate this. <clears throat> you know, systems have a life cycle. Typically, you deploy something for some period of time. I don't know, 10 years, and after 10 years, you, you, you upgrade it, you replace it. There is no you know, refresh cycle for a city. You kind of built the city once, and then it sort of goes down <laughs> from there. You know, we're, we're trying our best to refresh it, but we have hundreds of thousands of miles of roads and bridges and buildings and complex underground infrastructure, and it's all decaying. Bridges will fall, and sadly they have. You know, while people have been driving across them. That will happen more frequently if you don't fix it. The infrastructure, the physical infrastructure is decaying. You know, if you, if you put, you know, five, 10, and in some cases, 25 and 30 million people in a very tight space, you get, it, it's an experiment. What, you know, what happens? Um, well, we see it, it it's remarkable. Um, you know, as, as, uh, as we all kind of um, try to make our way every day, uh, whether it's, getting clean water or access to medicine, and try to get jobs, have an income, have a decent quality of life. Um, the issues are getting um, more complicated as the populations get um, uh, larger and larger. Uh, there's a lot of good stories too. There are cities that are growing and their quality of life is improving. So we know we can get better at this. Uh, <clears throat> communities are resistant to change. You know, uh, uh, even with compelling information, uh, some communities don't want to um, change what has been a great service or uh, a, a, uh, uh, make the tough choices now. Perhaps uh, later we can make those choices. And we talked about that. You know, this is like in the, you know, government is almost like the, it's the same as a service economy. As we develop new products and as, as the years go by, there's greater expectations from consumers and great uh, increased uh, expectations from citizens. So those are not going down or staying flat. They are increasing. <clears throat> but with all this doom and gloom I've been projecting, there is a good story. Right? There's lots of really, really neat stuff going on. Um, there's lots of innovation happening at the city level. Um, there is lots of opportunity as a result. Um, just read the other day a prediction that uh, smart cities and technologies that enable the reversal of all these trends will be worth about a trillion dollars in about 2016, thereabouts. So if you're a vendor and you're looking for an opportunity, it's, it's cities. Um, money to be spent, problems to be solved. Um, and where, where it works well, if you look at cities around the world um, where um, you know, they're growing and they, they are doing some neat things, Vancouver comes to mind, Canada, um, there, are, there are very uh, good uh, successes. The thing is, governments can't do it alone. They won't do it alone. Citizens want to be engaged. Um, so the very nature of representation is changing. And technology just amplifies all that. So I want to talk about, the real reason I'm up here, I think, uh, is to talk about the digital city as sort of a response to some of those issues and perhaps some opportunity to co-create and collaborate with uh, my team and I in the city in um, inventing the future of democracy. Uh, so the digital city, uh, we have, a, we have a, an actual vision. This is the IT vision. It's not, don't quote me on this being the vision of the city. Uh, at some time it might be adopted, but right now this is really a vision that's being driven by myself and, and my team. Um, and uh, getting a lot of 
um, traction in, in, in the city itself and in the community. What does it mean? Well, I was, I was at a meeting today and I was uh, talking to some people within the city who had not heard of the term. And I was sitting around a table where there were stacks of paper. And I said, you know, one way to think about the digital city is we wouldn't be producing all this paper. I, I go to meetings and the paper's printed, and sometimes it's in color, there's a lot of ink consumed, and I end up, people end up as they walk out of the meeting, you know, trashing it, or having, you know, because the, the document's gonna be emailed to them. So part of it is eliminating, I wonder how much of a cost, right? There, there's definitely a cost in, in creating that documentation. In many ways, many things we do require, have regulation and requirements, so we mail stuff to people, like stacks of paper. Government has to mail things. It does add up. It's big numbers when you add it all up. Uh, the digital city is a lot more than that, though. It's completely new ways for people to reach out and touch government. You know, the ability to participate in debate. Um, in Palo Alto, we, uh, a lot of our debate happens on a Monday night. City council meets every Monday night. And um, the topic is raised. and uh, So you have to turn up, typically. Right? It, maybe the last thing on a Monday you want to do is turn up at the council meetings. You've had a tough day. Um, it can be long and you know very detailed, so it's exhausting for people. It's not the kind of entry barriers are often very high. Um, so it would be kind of neat if you could express your point of view outside of that forum. And increasingly, we're we're able to do that. Um, what else can I tell you about um, digital city? <clears throat> well, it, it's it's also about how we collaborate internally. Um, you know, we have email, just like every other organization, it's sort of a commodity. Um, but we're also exploring um, social collaboration, a completely new ways for departments to, to, to share and, and uh, uh, be part of a conversation. Um, so that's also part of the, what we mean by the digital city. Anybody go to this? Yeah, yeah. right there. A 10 hands approximately went up. Um, this is something we enabled. I, we won't take, the city of Palo Alto doesn't take credit for uh, the energy and excitement, the fun of this. But this was a, an event uh, that was really driven by Talent House and, and Innovation Endeavors, a few other startups here in the, uh, in the local area. Uh, so not, sorry, not startups, but uh, tech companies and tech related companies um, in, the, in the area. And we, uh, we shut down the block and we said, um, the, the organizers said, go ahead and, and, and sort of build applications and network and you know, uh, sort of perpetuate the greatness uh, of Silicon Valley, the stuff we do, let's, let's magnify it and create a platform for that. Well, when the organizers came to the city and they, they asked, you know, they came to, to myself and some of the other folks and we said, you know, what's the chances of shutting down a street? And we said, let's do it. Like, no hesitation, no bureaucracy. You know, they said, well, we need some security. We'll give you security. Yeah. Well, we need permits for something. We'll give you the permits. So we want to be enabling to these kind of cool things, completely new ways of developing applications, of building business, building opportunity. So that was just a block. Perhaps we'll scale that. What are the characteristics of a digital city? Kind of, this is putting some uh, meat on the bones here. Um, yeah, we believe that the access to government should be through any device. Um, this should clearly resonate with you. Um, yeah, if I think about it just specifically internal to our organization, um, so we have PCs that the, uh, the and with Windows, right? right. <laughs> so, uh, so we we I was asked, you know. I, so let me backtrack. We have, we have uh, desktop computers, and I said we would move very quickly to laptops. We would enable um, our, our workers to have laptops. Not unusual, by the way, for government folks to have desktops. So we move to laptops, and then people say, you know, what, you know when are you going to support a Apple devices? Um, you know, when can we do that? And I said, well, actually, I'm not, we're never going to support Apple devices. We're just going to support whatever device you have. I'm not going to create a policy for Apple and a policy for Windows and a policy for Ubuntu and you know, the, the point is we should make data and applications accessible no matter what device and that's certainly what we'll do internally. It also means that when you access um, content as a citizen, as a community member, you should be able to get to it with the device you trust. So, so straightforward for a lot of you, not so straightforward 
in the broader community where there still is sort of unfortunately a reliance on a, a particular operating system or, or type of device. Uh, we talked about that. Um, part of my talk tonight is uh, eventually I'm going to get to open data, uh, time permitting. Um, I realize this is not a term that is that well known by everybody. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's see if I can kind of describe it. Um, and I'll describe a situation. I think that's probably the best way to sort of give you an idea of the value of it. <clears throat> um, so there is a law, an act called the California Public Records Act. And, and um, if you wanted some information that we store, that we collected at some point in the government, in any government agency across the state, you simply request it. And we are obligated to provide it to you. Now it might be, it, it's certainly data that we store, but it might be hard to get to and it might be hard to deliver to you. And it's stuck in some proprietary database in some back office and who knows, you know, uh, um, either what format we would dump it into and then uh, do we get it to you on a CD or do we mail it to you? What access, what format do, you, do we need to convert it? It's actually a lot of work, typically has been a Star Trek, and it's just, um, so it incurs cost, but it's also inc inconvenient and sort of a showstopper for maybe um, sort of creating a more seamless experience between you and government. So open data says, forget about the request. Let's just make the data available from the outset. Let's just throw it out there. Um, and we will post it on our site, sorry, on a, on a website or some sort of platform where you can then easily uh, access it as you see fit. And there'll be multiple forums, in, in machine, machine readable form so you can access it. Um, seems like a, no, it's actually very reasonable. And, uh, it's still slow in the uptick. Um, when Vivek Kundra started as the first federal CIO, this, uh, this is one of the first things that, uh, that he pushed with um, Anish Chopra, the CTO of, of the federal government, is to create open, uh, sorry, data.gov as a place where federal uh, data will be posted. And to date, I think it's about 400,000 data sets are now available. Um, on the whole, everything, yeah, everything's up there. Um, and, and so you can kind of take this next level, what, you know, if you're just kind of taking the data, lifting it up and dropping it, at some point it is um, old, right? So why not just make it available as it's produced, make it just real time, and, and make available some API so you folks like yourself can just tap into it. So it really makes uh, that uh, um, access to data much more easy. It also enables governments to say, hey, you know what, see that data there? Could you build something with that data? Um, you know, we, we actually need something with that data. We can't build it, we can't afford it, or we don't, not, you know, we don't have the expertise, but you're smart, and perhaps you'd like to build something using that data. And today, at the sort of federal and social, sorry, federal, state, and local level, tens of thousands of apps have been built, everything from the web to right through to uh, iOS. Um, an increasing focus on social. Um, I can talk about open in a while, so why don't I move on. Um, we're also going to talk about smart. You'll hear a term smart cities. If you're going to figure out, if you're going to try to fix the problems that I described at the outset of my presentation, <clears throat> we're going to have to completely rethink how we do stuff, how we provide transportation, and healthcare, and clean water, and energy. Uh, everything that we typically almost take, we do take for granted, has to be rethought. And there's uh, some neat stuff happening. We're just at the start of the curve. It's a great area for innovation and great area for, for smart thinking. It's why you see all the big ERP vendors competing in the space. Because it's worth a lot of money and it's uh, big problems to solve. So, yes, sir. I knew. Mm -hmm. um, it is. It is. Um, yes. That usually, when you get right down to it, that's a monster problem for most cities. Where most mm -hmm. can't get there, or the AT&T doesn't work here, or Verizon doesn't work yes. here. Yes. And yet yeah, nobody has good Wi-Fi throughout the city. <clears throat> a few, well, San Jose just announced free. No, I don't know. Not good. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> okay, we have evidence here. So the gentleman's asking, "What about Wi-Fi? Is this is this part of it?" We 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 are definitely very supportive of, of having uh, free Wi-Fi. Are you going to provide it? 
Um, lots of, there's lots of good questions. There's some calls to that. And there's, I think it's a community debate. I think, I think the, uh, it's a bit premature for me to, to perhaps, uh, personally, I'm hugely supportive and would love to make it. Okay, I want to uh, talk to you about a case study to make this all a little bit real. So one of the things we did, uh, this kind of ties a lot of the characteristics of my talk together. Um, we recognized in Palo Alto that the infrastructure is aging, and we had to get a grasp of, well, we know that, uh, what do we have to do and how much will it cost? So at one level, you're sort of guessing, you're saying, well, it looks like it costs this much, and we can't make really good decisions out of that. Um, so the city formed a blue ribbon commission, a um, group of smart people who would go out and, and, and spend some time evaluating the condition of the city and how much it would cost to get it to the place where you want it, where the community would like it. And so they spent uh, some time doing this, came back, and um, the good news is it's, it's not a billion dollars, but the bad news is it's about $300 million. Um, and so we, we have to find a way um, to, based on what, we, what the community thinks we should do, what we go about fixing. Um, so you have an inventory of roads, right, and the condition of every road. And it turns out, this is like a, a revelation to me, um, there is a, a nationally recognized standard for rating the quality of a road. I mean, when you kind of reflect it, it seems rather obvious there should be something like that. It's a uh, pavement condition index, and it goes from zero to 100. And folks that are kind of certified to know, they look at the road you know, up and down the block, and they say this is a 65, based on the francs or the holes. Um, so this is what this is the kind of data they produce, right? This is sort of traditional government data, <clears throat> in many ways traditional organizational data. Um, this is um, actually what we're looking at here. It's, it's just a, it's an export to access, and you got every single block in Palo Alto and the rating of every single street. Um, so there's thousands of these, and the rating here is on the right hand side. Well, so you have a book of like pages of this, or you have give someone access to all this data. You give a community member who doesn't really spend much time on a computer or doesn't really have the patience, and you say, you've got to make some decisions from this. It's near impossible, right? It's, it's not good data. It's not good, uh, it's not good data to make decisions from in this form. So we said, well, let's try our sort of thesis around open data and uh, partnership with the community. <coughs> So I went ahead and sort of mocked up a visualization. This is from my whiteboard. And I said, you know, let's create a really simple form that if you were a uh, resident of Palo Alto, you could easily type in your address, see your street with a picture, and get the rating. And in fact, if the street picture wasn't good enough, you could upload your own picture. You could go outside and just take a photograph of it, photograph of it and you would get a picture of it. Um, we wanted to keep it. Um, I had no, so I should say from the outset, um, do this quickly with no cost. Right? That's quite, that's a challenge. <laughs> um, but there are smart ways of doing this today. So uh, myself and the mayor marched up to Stanford, and uh, we, uh, we, we, we grabbed some students. In fact, they were meeting to have a hackathon or a code jam. So they were going to spend 24 hours building apps. They wanted to build apps that had social good. They, in some way contributed to the community. And so we, uh, we got these students, we did our pitch. Uh, my asset was, my celebrity was the mayor, having him with me, it was easy to get uh, some students to work on our project. And um, notable here that it requires a lot of caffeine, a lot of food, um, and the you know, stamina to be up 24 hours. So I did my pitch and said, this is what we'd like to build. I said, that sounds cool, we'll have a, sh we'll have a shot at it. <coughs> so they went ahead and they, in 24 hours, they kind of built sort of a, a kind of a, uh, a, a rendition of what I thought uh, would be good. Um, and it was partially functioning, but it was like a really good prototype. Didn't entirely work. Um, they, they took photographs from, um, fixed from Google Maps, which is pretty neat. And the city manager still asks me why there are cats 
Um, so the ratings. Um, I don't know. I'm still trying to find out. No, they, this was, uh, you can imagine, it was 24 hours later, they were wrapping up and they had placeholders, and when they delivered the product, they left the placeholders. Um, so the good news is we had something that was working in 24 hours. The bad news is it wasn't good enough to deploy. It wasn't sort of production ready. So we went ahead and um, we reached out into the community again. And I, I met sort of three really bright, again, Stanford graduates who uh, pulled together a really robust working version of the prototype. And it's up and running today. It's called streetviewer.cityofhalalata.org. If you're a resident, hopefully you can type in your address. You'll get a you'll get the you know the the, the pavement um, condition index there on the left. We'll photograph your street and, and uh, you can you can upload pictures. Um, so a, a very new day. Lots of little qualities you know reflected in this example. Um, really, we just kind of gave them an open data set. We gave them a data set, uh, and we said you know build this. They used Google uh, Maps. Um, it, uh, we deployed it on Amazon, you know, it, uh, basically free. It doesn't hit a certain threshold, so that's delivered at no cost. So the, the, the whole thing was really just brain power. It was just our time and effort. Um, but uh, it has utility for the, for the city. Um, what I'd like to do is sort of wrap up just uh, with a couple of things. I wanted to uh, show you a few other examples of things that we've done. And then things that we thought, Tim and I thought might be interesting to challenge you with, if you are bored and, and uh, want, to, want to challenge it in the evening or the weekends. Uh, uh, the, the examples I'm going to give, by the way, are not exhaustive. We, we would love to do a lot of stuff. I just kind of picked a few that are really fun. Uh, this is one that works today. You can go to our website and uh, uses a combination of our GIS data um, to overlay and shows you where current and upcoming um, projects are in the city. Uh, it's kind of neat. Um, today, it's only web accessible. It's, it's kind of a um, a best effort type website. You kind of need to have this on a mobile device. Um, here's something we built for the uh, for public safety. Um, so this is uh, running on an Android. Uh, no, that's a iPhone. No? Oh, it's an Android. It is Android. Yeah. Um, and what this shows is the location of all the um, police cars and ambulances in the city. And that's uh, useful for deployment, for getting people quick to the center action. And that's in use today. It's a very important part of our uh, suite of products. Um, so not a, the, the technology here is kind of, it's GIS, it's uh, some, some um, radios, and, and uh, some, some Android. I'm not a burglar, can I use that? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's not, no, it's, it's, it's secure. Yeah. Sounds like a Cali. <laughs> it sounds like a Cali to me. <laughs> <laughs> it's an actor, it's <laughs> um, Here's a couple other things. Uh, actually, this one is the same, just two different views. Um, so, one of the things we live with, as you know, as residents of this part of the world, is um, the eventuality of, uh, of a, of a, of a pretty devastating um, uh, earthquake. And uh, what we want to do is do the best we can in advance, prepare. And we have uh, members of neighborhoods um, who will are ready to stand up and do certain things in the event of that um, happening. And uh, one of the things they can do is they can go around and photograph damage um, and then aggregates it into a central repository. And uh, we can make determinations about where we dispatch um, trucks to be able to fix things and police to be able to do various things. So this is a, um, a sort of damage report application. It, it's your typical sort of you know, reporting tool. It's photograph. It has GP, uh, location and, uh, and information. You can type in more details and take a photograph. Okay. So in order to allow some time for questions and stuff, let me get to some interesting mobile app challenges. Uh, should you be ready? Yeah, would you like to ask a question? Yeah, no, it's, what, what's really cool about the uh, Palo Alto earthquake application is I, I'm part of that, and I understand that they're working on uh, developing a system to um, uh, use uh, just the non-cellular communication uh, within the city by um, installing uh, antennas at various locations so that uh, you can actually 
do what you suggested mm -hmm. without having a cellular network running. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, thank you for sharing that. Uh, you're absolutely right. It, it, it's multi-dimensional. Um, it, it could. It's a great driver for Wi-Fi, because right, this is a great use case. Um, we're looking at a whole variety of ways of connecting. Um, interestingly, I was at another presentation, and I made the point of saying, in a devastating earthquake, everyone's going to have their mobile devices, and they'll have their photographs, and they won't be able to do anything with them, because they won't be able to connect. Right? They won't be able to aggregate or submit the information. And somebody in the audience pointed out to me, and they said, that seems a little bit sort of exaggerative. Apparently in Haiti, which had a massive earthquake a few years ago, total devastation. They could still send messages. SMS was still working. So um, I, I was an, so I, I've actually, I'm more reserved now in making the conclusion uh, that we would have absolutely no service. Um, it's, we always have to plan for every eventuality. Uh, but it is interesting to know the resilience of, of some of our networks in the, in the event of a, of a catastrophe. Um, so the first thing, I've got three, I think, three uh, challenges here that you might be interested in tackling. Uh, the first one is uh, a, a smartphone and tablet app for the Street View app. And we only made it for a browser. And, um, you know, we, want, we have to make, it to make sure it worked on all the browsers, and that, that's a lot of fun. Um, so it works on Chrome and Safari and IE and Firefox. Uh, so technically, you could argue that it could run on an iPad. Um, it would be neat to have an app. Um, and I don't think there's a lot of work, but it would have, again, huge utility. It's like low effort, big return. OK, sparking, parking space finder. <clears throat> now, I like this one a lot, and I'll tell you why. Uh, in many cities, there are smartphone apps for telling you if there's a space available. Right? You can it can tell you in public parking lots, even on streets. The reason they can do that very often is because the parking meter itself is sending out information that is picked up on your smartphone app, and it tells you, I guess it makes these, maybe there's sensors on the parking space, I don't know. Won't, however they do the technology, the conclusion is there's some certainty, some level of certainty that there's a parking space available. None of the parking spaces in Palo Alto have any electronics. For the most part, they're free, as you know. Um, so the challenge with this one is what kind of math, sort of like theory, could you apply to estimate the chances of a parking space? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nice. You see, that's, so I knew, I know Palo Alto, there's probably a lot of PhDs, masters, all sort of math folks in here. Uh, or pro, I mean, just as programmers, this is a really interesting problem to solve. I think you could say, now you could argue, I think Tim uh, and I had a nice debate, if, if there was 90% chance that there was a parking space at City Hall, would you go? Right? Well, I'll, I'll let you think about that, right? Uh, but I think this is really interesting. We're not gonna be able to put sensors or parking meters in every single space, but how can we still make the app to help you make decisions where you're gonna park? Yes, sir. Uh, I would just tell you, a Palo Alto resident and a big attendee of meetups, it's, it's it's the problem you have is that in any given spot in the city, like the other day I was at a meetup in downtown at six, seven o'clock at night, should be no problem at all, and it was solid from top to bottom in two parking garages for the various events like this mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. So I think a factor would have to be understanding the total load, if you will, yes. at the time of day of the reason why they're events, because it's 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 very unpredictable. I have to tell you, the, living in the town and trying to find a spot sometimes. Yeah. <clears throat> Good stuff. Um, let's see, okay, smart grid app. Uh, so uh, let me give you, for those who are not familiar with smart grid, let me give you any sort of, uh, before I do that, you have a question? Sir, <coughs> comment on the parking also. There's actually city officials who go on also and enforce the two hour limits. I mean, the guy actually painfully goes, types in the, I was talking to him and he said, there's no better way we can do this that he actually types the, the number plate and says to enforce the two, are there some way you can actually reduce on that off? Yeah. Well, famous last words, there's no better way. <coughs> there's always a better way, I think. So, John, do you ever worry that if you pose these app ideas, that all these developers, many of whom live in Palo Alto, will rig the app so that it doesn't <laughs> do what you want? <laughs> 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 there's always a parking spot. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'll, I hate to share this, but I will because it's kind of related. 25, year, 25 years ago in college, doing my first undergraduate, and the professor says, when you write software, you should put a little bug in it so they have to call you back so you can make more money. You probably heard that. Yeah. <laughs> it's a terrible thing to say. Um, That's why he's a professor. So we, we are going to start to experiment in Palo Alto with a uh, with smart grid. Um, uh, sort of the, the basic description is get a little unit plugged into your house, um, and rather than you know the kind of very old traditional manner in which you get your electricity bill today and it's sort of um, reported daily or monthly. Um, this is almost real-time reporting of your energy consumption in your house. Um, from a utility perspective, which Palo Alto is, we have complete utility, um, it will be useful if sort of a, as, you, as you drive by, you could pick up the, um, the, the utility numbers directly in the device or have it all just aggregate on, on a central location. Um, so it's useful. Um, there's all sorts of other things, how you know, estimating, predicting the, number, the, the quantity of um, energy to, to, to procure and distribute and distribute effectively across the city. Lots of really interesting applications at the provider level. It's not so clear yet what the applications are though for the consumer. Um, you probably can think of some obvious ones. Um, uh, and, um, and, and so uh, what, what I'm challenging you with today is um, as we kind of start to explore smart grid in Palo Alto, we'll do a, uh, we're doing about 200 homes, I believe, um, and that will produce an enormous amount of data. Um, what would be interesting, useful for consumers, for citizens, to do with that data? Um, now, I, I think uh, we certainly need to consider the aspects of privacy, confidentiality, so we might uh, autonomize the, the data. Well, I would say we would autonomize it, not might. Um, we would, but in, in, while retaining its mean, meaningfulness, right? Um, so there's an interesting set of problems here. Yes. Um, I read some research about how if um, people know what their neighbors are using in terms of electricity, and they're using a bug, they will actually uh, throttle down their use just so that they are in line with the Nice. Some behavioral economics there. Yes. Yes, Again, to the resident, sorry. So the Palo Alto Utilities is actually, I mean, the utilities are provided as a city service. So what is the relationship or challenge of the CIO's office to the utility department? I myself have dealt with them a few times. Mm -hmm. Sometimes they're not as flexible as uh, one would like them to be. I'm just curious to do how that, how the relationship between the sort of the utilities objective goals and your goals are in terms of alignment and focus. Mm -hmm. um, I can't really speak of history. I mean, I'm relatively new CIO. Well, I'm surprised you got 200 homes. That's why I'm, yeah. I'm kind of wanting to know how it's working for you now, I guess. Oh, they're, they're, I, <coughs> we're building a good partnership. Um, you know, the utilities for me is just another sort of department in which I have to service and, and provide quality services, and, and we want to innovate, and so we're, uh, we're building a nice partnership uh, with them. How does smart grid um, differ from smart meters? <coughs> it's the same thing. Okay. It could be, I guess it's a subset. It's the same. <clears throat> I think this is the last one. I want to suck up all the time here. Um, so augmented Palo Alto is this idea that we have where, um, again, the uh, final utility is not actually determined, but it would be interesting to be able to wander around the streets of Palo Alto or drive around the streets. Um, and to be able to use your device to um, point to the, at an item and get some really meaningful information. Um, uh, for example, not every upstairs on University or Calif California Avenue is known what a startup or what companies in there. It would be kind of interesting to be able to uh, point your iPhone upstairs and it would tell you here's where XYZ organization is. Or we think it would be interesting to have historical information this was the birthplace of Facebook or AOL or uh, one of the others. Um, and other historical information about the street, just like a railway, or if there was an earthquake on the street. Um, and so the challenge is, could you um, build this for Palo Alto and um, make it such that you could uh, reuse it? It could have multiple uses. One could be a, who's in that building, and another one could be the history of this street or the history of our town. So I'm gonna conclude there.
Um, I guess I'm going to take about five minutes of questions, if possible. Um, uh, lots of. Oh, okay. Uh, I'll start with you. Uh, do you have a monetization model? So we, you have a data, we develop something. How do we monetize that? Mm -hmm. So well, let's just, I'm sorry, I'm yeah. since we don't have mics around, if you could just repeat the questions for everybody in the audio. Yes, okay, so thanks. Uh, so the question was, um, there's lots of ways in which you can build apps for, for our city. What's, is there any monetization model? <clears throat> so two ways to, kind of, at least two ways to think about it. I always think there's two ways, but there's always more. Right? The first thing is, a, lot, a large part of this is social good. So there, there is a, uh, a decent part of our community that wants to do stuff because they live in the community and actually would be useful for them and useful for their neighbors. So we find that a lot of people are developing with this and doing interesting things just because it's, it's good, it feels good and it's, and it's a contributor. Okay, that aside, because a lot of you are entrepreneurs and you're like, well, I wanna make some money. The key thing is if you build it for us and you can prove it for us, you've got thousands of other cities in America and the whole world, right? If you do it well and we're a platform, you can scale it and sell it. You know, we would never take, there would be no, you know, I think proprietary around building for us. We, we, we certainly do. I mean, we, we, uh, we have people who are always, well, we, so we have real sort of budgeted issues like we, we uh, business intelligence is important, you know, getting more rich data internally and being able to interpret it. So we have a investment cash for that and we go out and we love those people either who have an off the shelf app or people who, um, are willing to build it for us. So we have those. Um, the question is if all we did was focus on those, we'd never move our democracy forward. We'd never do the cool and innovative things we want to do. I mean, our goal is not just to kind of move the needle forward a little bit, but it's to radically change how government is delivered. <laughs> um, I, I started and repeat the question, I should have. Um, the question was whether Palo Alto would pay for it. Yes, sir. Do you have a flagship project for getting people on board this? It's hard, it's sort of, you had a loud voice, that so was good, but maybe for the camera. Um, do we have a flagship product that kind of Pro project. project? Or a model project. Uh, I, I would say the answer is probably no to that. We don't have a model project today. Um, we are trying a lot of little things. Uh, the digital city is made up of lots of, lots of things. Right? You know, one of the things we're trying to do right now, one of the things we're engaged in is a transformation of the permitting process. You know, it's a million dollar project for the city and we're buying a ton of software, we're hiring a lot of staff, like we're hiring, um, I shouldn't say a lot, we're hiring a small set of staff to do new roles. Um, and, and so that is, if you like, one flavor of digital city. Um, but in terms of like open data, hackathon, get it done quick, Street Viewer is probably one of our best examples. So, so what is the app idea that I, I think some others have done it, Think of the audience as people with sort of accessibility needs. You know, that some of the road signs are not. You know, if, if somebody is blind or visually impaired, mm -hmm. it's difficult for them to see. So why not build an app or something mm -hmm. that's sort of visually mm -hmm. replaces that and just gives them a guideline? Hey, mm -hmm. this is over there. You know, mm -hmm. we can go to a restaurant and mm -hmm. walk in and they can read the menu. And if you can actually ask the restaurant. Mm -hmm. Can, can, can we generate this question? Do you have a website where, where you post and other people post the ideas and somebody can vote? And you vote also. So we can rate the projects. Yeah. There isn't one of those yet. We plan to release because one of those. The government the, 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 the government has some like Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The local one for this. Okay. I'll take this mic around. Let's slow down the questions so John has time to repeat them. <laughs> and then we'll make sure that everybody can hear what was just said. So could yeah. you, do you want to bring us up to date on what was just asked? Uh, so I'll do both pieces just to be fair. Um, a app for helping uh, people with some limitations of physical or otherwise limitation. Um, I think it's a fabulous idea. We would never stop anyone from building any application they wanted. And if it was useful, we, we would certainly be happy about that. Um, I think your question was, um, I, I believe you're asking, um, you're kind of abstracting it and saying, is there a place in which anyone could submit great ideas, people could vote on them, and then you could select the best ones. Um, San Francisco has, I think, sfimprove.com. Um, it's something that addresses that identically. We will do that, uh, for sure. But I wouldn't, don't wait for that. <laughs> don't wait for it. Right. How about 
goodness me, you, you choose. Hello, thank you. Um, so to make your open data available device independent, what do you rely on? I assume you rely on some standards, which ones? So we're very um, early in the process. The, the typical ones you see on uh, data.gov would be um, XML, CSV, XLS, uh, just your basic. Uh, it, one of the principles of open data, it's the, it's the most sort of basic, sort of atomized data that there is for that data set. Um, and, and it should be machine readable. <laughs> Um, how do you decide what data should be public and sh is mm -hmm. useful, and how do you decide what degree you need to massage mm -hmm. the data before putting it out there? Sure. Good question. Excellent question. Um, it, it, so there's you know, baby steps, and then there's what we what we'll get to. Uh, we shouldn't ever decide. Um, you know, unless there is some privacy, no one privacy item. I give an example of that. For the utility, we collect credit cards. And there's there's payment card industry regulations about how it's protected. That would not be a good candidate for open data. Um, for the most part, the stuff that governments uh, collect is yours. It's the people's data, and so we should never make a decision. We should make it all available. What was the second part of the question? <laughs> um, to what degree do you need to uh, oh. search the data so that it's I think to the degree it's not individually recognized. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, what is it currently a repository or listing of all the type of open data available um, by name or searchable? Um, not yet for uh, Palo Alto. Not yet. Most, um, so, but soon. Um, <clears throat> most cities, we kind of, it's one of those great times when. We didn't all have to sit in the room and agree, and it kind of just came together by just naturally, which is um, you can append the start of the city name with uh, data. So data.seattle.gov, data.newyork.gov, um, data.cityofhalawada.org. You know, so just you stick data in front of it, and that's how you get typically access to the system that's providing all these data sets. So I'll follow up with that. How are you hosting this data? Are you running your own servers, or are there services that can host government data for individual cities in sort of a standardized way? There, well, it's it's a competitive space actually. There's there's several um, competitors that are doing quite well. Um, there's, um, I'm pretty sure, data.gov is still running on Socrata, Socrata.com, and it's a good exemplar of a vendor who's doing it. Um, and they do both, I believe. They do, do both um, hosted plus pointing to your uh, repository. Um, we've not yet made a uh, decision on the solution for, uh, for the city of Alaska. Um, okay, let's take one more question over here in the far left. I have a question. I'll bring you the mic. Um, what is the difference between open data and open source data? Mm. Are you? Is there opportunity for people who can say we can replace your paper with real time collaborative? All those words. Mm -hmm. Would love that. <laughs> Would love that. Yes, big yes. Um, and I'll give you like I just thought of an example. You're, you're not part of Canopy, are you, by chance? No. no. So uh, there's an organization called Canopy, and uh, they're a uh, one of the several organizations in cities that uh, sort of take care of the inventory of trees. Um, and Palo Alto is, is in love with our trees for obvious reasons. Um, and we, um, uh, every year there's an inventory made and then it's available online. And I got to talk to these folks in this uh, great organization and how they do it every year there's a, uh, they get an intern on a bicycle and a clipboard and he cycles every road in Palo Alto and he, with a pencil, marks it. Um, so I said, we ought to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> we ought to make that automated. Um, the unfortunate thing he's going to do it, I think, in a month. So we, you know, maybe we could we could turn it around in that time. But they didn't want to engage in some sort of software development that quickly. But we think we can do it for next year for them. Uh, we can we can we can engage with a with the community to build a solution like that. But that's just a great example. Um, 
the other day I, I had to, um, um, one of my staff had need a re to get a reimbursement on a purchase they'd made. And they, I would, I'm the last signature on this list of signatures. Um, and this is sort of your traditional, what you would think of as traditional government bureaucracy. It's a piece of paper filled in with lots of fields, multiple signatures. And the poor girl had to go around the building getting multiple signatures before she came to me and I signed it and then she could get paid. That should be electronic. I mean, it's, you know. So we're looking at some that. So, so I know like a lot of your data, the county recorder's office, real estate related. In some cases, you already have third parties in there who manage that for you. Mm -hmm. Are they required also to get that data as part of this open process? They're, they're not today, but there is um, a um, legislation that is being promoted uh, through the California, California Assembly to help um, I'm not sure if mandate is the right word, but to, 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 to encourage, yeah. So the, let's just say um, you can do your own sort of homework on it. Um, there, there are lots of, uh, of the legislative tools in play to see if we can make that a mandatory thing in the years ahead um, so that everybody will be required. If you create data for government or capture it, it's freely available through open data. Um, on, interesting, I'll just give you one tidbit I thought fascinating. Um, so Barack Obama, <clears throat> historical president, first day on the job, he could have done one of a million things. One of the first things he signed was open data memorandum. I think that's pretty remarkable. It's one of the first things he ever did as president. Um, and so it wasn't mandatory, but it required at that point every federal agency to uh, commit to making their data available freely. So as we wrap up, what is the what ways are available for us to continue to engage with you? I see Twitter ID, but in terms of open forums, and where, where's the next place we can see you, for example? <laughs> and how would you like people to engage with you? We, we, we certainly, I've got to improve it because I can't have five or six hundred people, you know, um, emailing me at once. Uh, but now, you know, I, I would be. I'm so excited when people do reach out and they sort of do start working with us. Uh, certainly Twitter, sort of contemporary way you can get in touch with me. Uh, my email is online um, on, on our website. That's pretty easy. Um, uh, so until t such time as we get the open data, you know, our site up and running in terms of open data sets and challenges, um, until we get that sort of um, idea market up where you can submit ideas and vote on them, um, I think I'm going to have to say me. Um, and I'll give up business cards as well. Um, but we will find other ways. There is a form on our website. You can contact us too. Um, but there's multiple ways for now. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.